Thomas. I'm Thelma Thomas, an art historian. I work with late antique and Eastern Christian visual and material culture, and I have a longstanding interest in textiles. Our group focuses on a Syriac manuscript in Williams College and its historical and cultural contexts. This is an image that the image that hooked me into the workshop. And this is our focal piece, the Williams College Syriac Codex. The image is vividly dimensional and inviting as the hand lifts the cover, opening the book to reveal textile and text inside. The temporal dimensions of this image attracted my attention. The signs of wear that are the traces of the book's long life of use and in the venerable traditions of craft, teasing conceptions of materiality reeled me in. Um, the juxtaposition of textile and text, leather and cloth and parchment. The text I recognize only is using Syriac script. I can't read it. However, the textile, block printed with a resist and then dyed, is a kind of textile I recognize as ever present in long distance networks of trade. So later I'll say more about this block printed cotton cloth. And for now, I'll turn to the historical background for the type of cloth. Cotton remained one of the many materials and goods circulating through extensive Afro-Asiatic trade networks. The block printed cottons were first produced in India and traded from at least the second century all along the Silk Roads to the east, to Western China, and to the west in Syria and along the Red Sea coast. Throughout late antiquity, they continued to be produced in India and are particularly associated with Gujarat on the west coast often called Gujarati textiles. And farther west, they continued to be traded to Syria and Egypt, Nubia and Ethiopia. In the mid 20th century, a significant number were discovered in Egypt at a site near Cairo, Fustat. Many more textiles of this type were later attributed to Fustat and came to be called Fustat textiles. Through various transformations of the product and expansion of production, these textiles have continued to be traded until now in the 21st century. Now, the text of the Williams Codex is Christian, a Syriac version of the New Testament, and it is possible that Syrians, including Christian Syrians, traded in such textiles, as there is archeological and textual evidence of Syrians trading in textiles from the Roman period and there is the memory of Syriac speaking Christian colonies of merchants in India that goes all the way back to the Apostle Thomas settling in Kerala on the West Coast. Another set of Christian missions was involved in the modern history of this manuscript. The manuscript was acquired in the late 19th century, the heyday of Westerners, that is Europeans and Americans, collecting Eastern Christian Bible manuscripts. The man who gave this manuscript to Williams College, Alpheus Andrews, was an American missionary in the region of Eastern Turkey, based in Mardin. Andrews was a serious collector of Bible manuscripts who developed numerous purchasing sources throughout the Tour of Dean, an area that was then in the late Ottoman period, both multicultural and fairly heavily Christian of mainly Armenian and Syrian Christians of various creeds. Andrews had acquired the Williams Codex insert in the region where he had been deployed to help endangered Christian communities. Andrews was associated with other Bible hunters who were not all missionaries. Most well-known and connected to Andrews are the scholars James Rendell Harris, and the Sisters of Sinai, Agnes Smith Lewis and Margaret Smith Gibson. As of yet, there's no corpus of Syriac bindings. Many of the early Eastern Christian Bible manuscripts that these Bible hunters collected did not have the bindings um, for many reasons, including because the churches and monasteries in the region needed money for, to repair and rebuild and 
increasingly, they needed money for relief operations for their communities. The churches and monasteries often sold manuscripts that were in poor condition and no longer being used, as they had no means to conserve them. Sadly, despite the efforts of these local institutions and the efforts of foreign missions, many of these Christian communities in the region were wiped out. As Sylvie Marion has noted, some of the manuscripts from these communities bear traces of that horrific violence of the late Ottoman period. So Aaron will tell us more about the historical context and history of our manuscript. Thank you, Thelma. I'm Aaron Butts, an associate professor at the Catholic University of America, and I specialize in Christianity in the Near East, including especially Syriac Christianity. I want to begin with a few more general words about Syriac Christianity before I turn to this particular Syriac manuscript. Syriac Christianity is first attested in the early centuries of the Common Era in Edessa, which is present-day Orfa in southwestern Turkey. From there, it spread across much of the Middle East, especially the Eastern Roman Empire and the Sasanian Empire, reaching ultimately all the way to India and Central Asia. What scholars refer to as Syriac Christianity has likely never been a single homogeneous monolith. Rather, Syriac Christianity has always consisted of a variety of communities of different backgrounds, whether cultural, linguistic, dogmatic, etc. These diverse communities are, however, united by the classical Syriac language and its literary tradition. A fine example of the literary tradition of Syriac Christianity is the manuscript before us today, William College Codex 37. On the slide, you see the front of the manuscript with its broken wood board. Here's a view of the spine. We'll return to the biting a bit later. And on this slide, you see images of the back cover with the textile on the interior, which will be the main focus of our presentation. This manuscript is written in the Syriac language and contains the entire Syriac New Testament, according to the so-called Peshitta version, which is the most widely used version of the Bible in Syriac Christianity. In the right image, you see the heading for the Gospel of Mark, written in red ink at the bottom left. And in the left image, you see the heading for the Epistle of Philippians. Notice that the Syriac has a scribal error. The scribe omitted the second P, and Alphaeus Andrus corrected it or at least tried to, but also seems to have made a mistake himself. As I already said, the manuscript once contained the entirety of the Syriac New Testament, but I should note that the first nine chapters of Matthew are now lacking, given that the first choir is missing. I'll come back to this shortly. The manuscript is written in what is called the Estrangula script, which is the most formal bookhand often used for biblical manuscripts. Based on paleography, several colleagues who examined the manuscript before me, including Sebastian Brock, Andreas Neupel, and Gregory Kessel, assigned the manuscript to the 10th to 13th century, and most probably to the 12th century. Some 500 years after its original production, this manuscript was repaired and rebound, and it is at this time that the textile was likely added. This repair seems to be commemorated in a renewal note which you can see on the slide. There are many interesting aspects to this note, but I'll only mention a few of them here. The renewal is said to have taken place in Sirt at the Church of Our Lady in 1632-33. Thus, we have a particular place in time. Two people are specifically mentioned, priest Sarkis, who actually did the renewing, and the Wakil Meru, under whose auspices the renewal seems to have taken place. I want to stress that this note describes the renewal as taking place at a church with the priest as the actor. This would, it seems, refer to a religious ceremony, probably some type of consecration. While the note obviously provides some precious details, including the specific year and place, it does not explain what physically happened to the manuscript and who might have done this physical work. Both of these questions are of great interest to us here, given that the textile was likely added during this repair. Fortunately, there's some intriguing clues in the manuscript. I want to begin with the choir signatures. On this slide, you see two different pages from the manuscript that have choir signatures. These signatures are in the bottom center. The Syriac ones are primary, surrounded by the four five dot symbols. And you can see that Armenian numbers have been added secondarily next to them. 
This suggests, I think, that the person who repaired and rebound the manuscript might have been an Armenian. That is, before taking the manuscript apart to rebind it, the binder added numbers in his own language, Armenian, so that he could put the book back together in the correct order. I cannot resist sharing one additional tidbit about these choir numbers. The numbering between the Syriac and Armenian is off by one, with the Armenian always being one less than the Syriac. So on the right side of the slide, the Syriac says two, but the Armenian one. And on the left side, the Syriac has three, but the Armenian two. This pattern holds throughout the manuscript. This difference in number suggests, I think, that when the renewal was done in 1632-33, the manuscript was already missing the first choir, just as it is today. I want to look at another Armenian connection. In a number of places throughout the manuscript, scrap parchment has been added as a reinforcement. And this scratch parchment has Armenian writing on it. On the right side of your screen, you see the scrap parchment added at the spine fold, and on the left side, on the upper corner of the folio. Even if you can't read Armenian, you might be able to tell that this scrap parchment with Armenian writing comes from two different Armenian manuscripts. Thus, we can be confident that the person who repaired the manuscript had access to scraps from multiple Armenian manuscripts. One of these scraps has a particularly interesting story to tell. On the slide, you can see a magnified version of the Armenian writing from the previous slide. If you look very closely, you might be able to make out a second layer of writing that appears as if in white. This scrap actactually comes from an Armenian manuscript that was a palimpsest. That writing that appears to be white is the original. It's actually the older form of the Armenian script, and so probably dates to before the 14th century. At some point in time after this, the old Armenian manuscript was scraped, bleached, and then reused for a different Armenian text. It here seems to come from a colophon. And then by 1632-33, that second Armenian manuscript had fallen out of use, was cut up, and used as scrap parchment to repair our Syriac manuscript. This piece of parchment has lived many interesting lives. And now I'm going to hand the conversation over to Georgis, who will discuss the bindings of the Syriac manuscript. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, my name is Georgios Boudalis. I'm uh, a book conservator at the Museum of Byzantine Culture in Thessaloniki. And my, my research interests are, um, um, have to do with the uh, evolution of bookbinding structures, mostly in the Eastern Mediterranean, from late antiquity until the 17th, 18th century. So I'm um, starting, um, I'm going to give a very brief um, description of the binding of the manuscript we're discussing here, as well as point out to the different ways um, textiles have been used on manuscripts um, in one way or another. So I'm showing you again the two uh, photographs we've seen before. It is the right hand board of the manuscript uh, uh, William 37, Syriac 37. Um, you can already see um, the, the, the peculiar pattern of the lacing with which the board is attached to the book block. Um, and then on the left hand uh, board, uh, which would have been the backboard for this book, uh, you can see that the, the leather cover still survives in part. Uh, it is decorated with blind tooling. And uh, quite interestingly, for our discussion here, the interface of the board is lined with uh, uh, a block printed uh, fabric for which uh, uh, Thelma will be uh, telling you uh, more in a few minutes. Uh, then the, these are three photographs of the book, the spine to the left, uh, the four edges in the middle and the head edges uh, of the book uh, in the, to the right. Um, you, you can get an idea of the binding, uh, but I think uh, there are different things you can notice already. The textile in the spine lining, the, the vestiges of the end band, et cetera. But I think uh, things will be a bit more clear once um, we see um, these drawings, which I like to call anatomical drawings because they actually show the parts um, uh, um, from which uh, a, a codex uh, bound like this uh, is composed. So basically we're dealing with a book block composed of gatherings. Uh, the gatherings are uh, stitched or sewn together with a specific way, uh, more about that in a second. Um, then there are two boards which are connected to the book block. Then there is a spine lining, uh, a textile or more. 
uh, which is uh, pasted on the spine of the book block and extending on the outer face of the boards. Uh, then there are end bands shown to the head and tail of the, of the book. And uh, uh, then there is a leather cover covering the whole. And at the end, there is a, a pair, in our case, just a pair of fastening straps, which would have uh, secured the book uh, when not in use. Let's very quickly and very briefly see um, most of these uh, elements. Uh, I have shown this animation before, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail, just to give you a visual um, impression of how these books were shown, uh, how the gatherings of these books were shown. And so uh, this is a common technique. This is a technique common for all the book binding traditions of the Eastern Mediterranean, with probably the exception, only the exception of the Armenian bindings. And uh, once uh, shown, this is what um, a book bound or uh, shown like that would uh, look like. Um, uh, so uh, it is a very typical, a very characteristic uh, image and technique. And it is interesting because the same exactly technique was uh, apparently uh, used uh, in late antiquity in the areas and in the cultural context where the codex first appeared and was uh, gradually established. Um, so it is, a, uh, it is possible that this technique was adapted or adopted really uh, from uh, fabric and cloth items like socks of which we find uh, a number in excavations, mostly in Egypt. And so that technique, which is called the cross knit looping, was probably uh, the, um, uh, the prototype, let's say, of the technique used to show together the gatherings of a multi-gathering codex, of a codex like the one we're seeing here. And it is interesting also that this technique has survived in all these binding traditions of the Eastern Mediterranean until the 17th century, virtually unchanged from the from the earliest centuries, from late antiquity until the 17th century, sometimes even later for the Islamic tradition, for example, even to the 19th or even the 20th century, the technique has remained uh, virtually unchanged. Uh, so once the book block was shown and the boards attached, uh, the next step was to uh, paste the spine lining, what we call a spine lining on the, on the spine of the book block. Uh, that is a fabric which would cover uh, the book block, the spine of the book block, and extend onto the outer face of the boards, and which um, was meant to be uh, helping uh, stabilize the book block, reinforce the attachment between the boards and the book block, uh, and, uh, and uh, smoothen the spine, really. Um, so normally there is a plain textile for that, used for that purpose, but occasionally you find textiles, not, not rarely really in the Middle East, you find textiles um, dyed with um, uh, indigo or occasionally textiles which are patterned. An example you can see to the right. And more rarely, you find more elaborate uh, textiles, more elaborately decorated textiles, like the example to the left, which is from a Byzantine binding. It's a, an, uncommon, um, um, an uncommon thing to find such decorated, uh, so, so much decorated. Uh, textiles in Byzantine book bindings. And the example to the right is from a Georgian manuscript of the 10th century. Again, you can see that uh, the fabric used is probably a cutout from a, from a vestment, from a, probably from a tunic. And uh, another example I want to show is this one, which again, uh, the textile used for the spine lining was probably most likely uh, a cutout uh, from uh, possibly a liturgical vestment like the example I'm uh, showing you here to the bottom um, and comes from Egypt. Uh, now, the next thing where uh, the connection between books and textiles can be clearly seen is are the end bands and end bands are for um, books what the edge finishes are for textiles. So uh, they were worked at the two edges of the spine, the head and the tail edges, and they were meant to be uh, worked to be there in order to uh, block the structure, reinforce the edges of the book block, and at the same time decorate uh, the edges, much in the same way as they did for textiles. And it is in fact this idea that actually explains why we find exactly the same techniques used both in uh, books and in edge finishes of textiles. And I'm showing you, I'm showing you here a few examples. Uh, again, uh, to the background, uh, uh, a fabric, a late antique fabric, 
uh, from the seventh or eighth century and uh, a detail from an end band of a Greek uh, codex dated in the 14th century. Uh, and these four images here are all from different books. Um, the example to the top left is the, um, is the end band of the codex we are talking about here, the William Codex Syriac 37. Um, and the other examples uh, are from a Syriac, from an Armenian, and from Byz and a Byzantine codex. And they are actually exactly the same technique, end bands made with the same technique. Um, in the example of the Syria Codex I'm showing you here, also made with exactly the same colors. And this is an interesting feature for different reasons, one of which is that we, uh, we have to always remember that these book cultures of the Eastern Mediterranean, which we want or like more or less to consider as distinct, they, are, they have more common features than uh, different features. And this is something that comes back again and again when, when one is talking about manuscripts in the Middle East. Uh, the board lining um, was uh, next. Again, that's the images. Uh, Thelma will be saying more. Um, um, the idea of the spine lining was probably to smoothen the inner face of the boards because there was thread there. There were irregularities there, and possibly they wanted they, they wanted uh, this to be hidden. And uh, sometimes you uh, indeed have the feeling that um, one of the reasons of the spine lining was also to um, to improve the image of the book, to make the book look nicer and uh, more beautiful. And this is another example from a Syria codex in the Sinai and uh, the St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai from the 13th century. Uh, and another part of the book where textiles were used is the uh, cover. And normally uh, until the 16th, 17th century, um, uh, one would expect to find expensive textiles used to cover the most precious books like the gospel book. Um, and these are three examples exactly showing that idea, silk textiles, richly patterned silk, silk textiles or silk velvet textiles were the norm. Later on, um, you find um, simpler textiles used for simpler books as well as the examples shown uh, here. Uh, two more things to say before um, handing back to Thelma. Um, you can find textiles in manuscripts also used as curtains uh, when one is dealing with uh, richly illuminated uh, manuscripts like, um, like the, the manuscript I'm showing you here from the 10th or 11th century uh, from the St. Catherine's Monastery, a very, uh, one of the uh, masterpieces of Byzantine art really. And you can see that originally, uh, this must have had, excuse me, um, this uh, purple curtain, which at some point um, uh, were cut off for some reason, for whatever reason, and they were later replaced with this uh, very fine and very thin uh, silk. Um, another, another part where textiles are used are the tiny pieces of cut uh, pieces of fabrics which were pasted or sewn at the four edge of the leaves of a manuscript in order to uh, permanently mark uh, a passage or a specific leaf of a book, uh, normally an opening of, of a chapter or something else where the, the, the user would like to have a quick and easy access to that specific part of the book. So it is common to find um, textiles, small pieces of textiles, obviously cut out from, uh, from uh, fabric items or whatever um, provenance uh, and pasted uh, to this. Sometimes these textiles are extremely uh, interesting, even if tiny, they're very interesting. The example to the left is a to the left is uh, um, an interesting example. It's about uh, less than two centimeters, um, uh, but it is a silk textile uh, woven with silk thread and with thin um, cut parchment gilded stripes. Okay, so I'm sure a textile historian would have uh, much to say more about this. And last, and I will uh, close with that, is that uh, in the binding we're dealing uh, with here, uh, as I said at the beginning, there is uh, at the left hand board, uh, the leather cover survives. And that leather cover is blind tooled uh, with uh, small tools. Uh, with uh, both the tools and the technique is, is a common, again, feature for all the binding traditions of the Eastern Mediterranean. 
uh, and uh, as well as, as uh, the pattern. And you can get uh, a closer idea um, uh, this. So all these small tools uh, were, were pressed uh, on, the, on the leather cover, uh, leaving there this permanent impression of their uh, motif. And I think now back to you, Thelma, for more about board linings. Our team has started to identify a set of Syriac bindings with cloth to parallel those known of Christian Ethiopian, Armenian, and Arabic manuscripts, as well as increasingly Greek manuscripts and those of other cultural traditions. I want to underscore a point that Yorgos made. Uh, uh, across the growing Syriac corpus, the cloth used to line the cover boards is in a range of materials, weaves, and patterns. Compound woven silk, as seen in the manuscript on the right, a precious material woven in a complex structure, would have been more valuable than plain woven cotton decorated by block printing. Again, as Gorgias has shown, um, cloth was used on exteriors. And I believe we will want to think of the medieval and post-medieval bindings with cloth as on a spectrum of monetary value for a wider range of binding materials from treasure bindings of gold and gems to combinations of metalwork with cloth. As here you see an enamel cloth on blue, uh, enamel plaque on blue cloth, likely silk, to bindings combining leather and cloth as on the Williams Codex and bindings entirely covered by cloth. The lining of the interior board of the Williams Codex uses two pieces of resist dyed block stamped cotton. The undyed reverse of each piece, not stamped with mordant, is visible in the folds of excess cloth at the edge here. The block printed pattern of the large piece was applied unevenly in a distinctive design of small floral motifs um, in, within pointed ovals that combine into four petaled flowers, effectively using positive and negative space in the overall repeating design. The block printed pattern of the smaller piece above seems to include the small mo floral motif and more linear motifs than in the large piece below, but both pieces may have come from the same cloth. Rosemary Krill and Ruth Barnes, scholars who specialized in the study of such cloth, assigned this cloth a late date, possibly 17th century, which accords well with the Arabic note on the 17th century, 17th century renewal of the manuscript. I show examples of fustat fabric acquired in Egypt to make the point that the fabrics with Egyptian provenance do not pre present very similar designs. I have found the closest comparisons for the design, uh, composite floral motif, positive negative space, and the overall patterning in that rich resource for Armenian cloth binding linings, Armenian block printed fabric. Some of the block printed cloths may have been new when used in the bindings. However, most bear traces of reuse. Many are, similar to the Williams Codex, patched together from two or more pieces. Again, for the linear patterning of the small piece at the top of the board in the Williams Codex, I find the closest comparisons among the textiles in Armenian manuscripts. And I want to underscore that these two designs might have belonged to the same piece of block printed cloth, utilizing different designs for the main field and border is here. Um, the example on the right seems to have a block printed inscription in Greek letters used to spell out another language. It's an apt comparison for the Williams Codex, which participated in a complexly multicultural set of manuscript traditions. Our historians have long tried to separate the cultural strands neatly, but the more we look, the closer we look, the more the strands defy expected cultural categories. By the Middle Ages, Indian style block printed fabric seems to have been 
produced in a range of places, including Egypt and Armenia for local markets and for trade. One strand of the Armenian tradition was the creation of enormous hangings for church sanctuaries called Kalamkari, as are um, called similar monumental Indian textiles. This large painted hanging, um, Armenian from India, is obviously patched, much as many of the cloth board liners and manuscripts are pieced together. And as this patchwork would seem to be integral to the aesthetics of the later phase of the life of the hanging, piecing cloths together in the manuscripts might well be expressive of the age of prior use of both cloth and manuscript. I want to note that although the folios of the Williams Codex have only the simplest of graphic decorations, mostly place markings, um, the Indian style block printed board liners do find echoes in the illuminations of more richly decorated manuscripts. The patterns of some such illuminations may be seen as up to date and reflecting a wide world of textiles, even as they fit comfortably within a venerable tradition of carpet pattern pages known from early Christian manuscripts of a millennium earlier. Within that long lived broader context of richly decorated manuscripts, um, I note that for art historical studies, the region of the Williams Codex looms large because of two important early manuscripts. <clears throat> the Syriac Bible, now of Paris of the sixth to seventh century and the Ravula Gospels with illuminations once thought to be solely sixth century because of the colophon. However, more recent art historical and codicological explorations have documented numerous 15th and 16th century intrusions, including overpainting and rebinding. So there are many reasons to pay attention across this corpus to the entire manuscript, to the manuscript as object and to its long life. Some of the issues I've touched upon intersect with current conceptual avenues of interpretation of Eastern Christian bindings from patchwork to iconicity and to the binding as clothing or dressing for the book and parchment as flesh. Any such interpretation of the Williams Codex will have to be grounded in the appropriate cultural context of its ongoing use. And I'm going to turn to Aaron now to um, co complete this for us. We want to conclude by using our case study manuscript, William College Codex 37, to reflect briefly on the connected histories of Syriac and Armenian Christians, as well as on the broader multiculturalism evidenced by manuscripts and the textiles employed in them. We've noted a number of connections between our Syriac manuscript and Armenian Christianity. As Yuri has pointed out, the binding of William College Codex 37 shares some features with the Armenian tradition, even others are typically Syriac or more broadly um, Mediterranean. On the pages of the manuscript, I've drawn attention to the addition of Armenian choir numbers, as well as to the use of reinforcement parchment with Armenian writing. And Thelma's made a number of illuminating comparisons between the textile in William College Codex 37 and Armenian block printed fabrics. In thinking about William College Codex 37, we should not forget that Syriac Christians and Armenian Christians have lived side by side basically since their beginnings until the present. After all, some of the earliest Armenian writings from the 5th century are translations of Syriac texts by authors such as Afrahad and Ephraim. And the histories of Armenian and Syriac Christianity continue to be connected for centuries, up through the tragic large-scale massacres of Christians in Eastern Turkey in 1915 and in the following years. And they remain connected today as belonging to the Oriental Orthodox Churches along with the Copts, Ethiopians, and others. Within the broader connected histories of Syriac and Armenian Christianity, there was a particularly intense period of contacts and interactions from the 16th to the 18th century in the area stretching from Lake Van to Edessa. One example of this, of course, is William College Codex 37, which we've been discussing today. 
Even more extreme entanglements of the Syriac and Armenian textual traditions are, however, found. On the slide, you see one such example. This is Yale Syriac 9, which is a manuscript written in so-called Armenian Garshuni. That is, the language is Armenian, but the script is Syriac. Manuscripts such as this raise a number of fascinating questions, including especially what were the socio-historical conditions that led to the Armenian language being written in the Syriac script. This local situation of connected history is emblematic of a much broader story as well. On the slide, you see a 17th century Christian Arabic gospel book housed at St. Catherine's Monastery. Interestingly, this manuscript seems to have been bound by an Armenian since it has an archetypal Armenian binding in all its features. Thus here we see Armenian book culture not only spanning much further geographically, all the way to the Sinai, but also crossing denominational borders, since the community of St. Catherine's is Melchite, whereas the Armenian and Syriac Orthodox are Mephisite. It's not only denominational borders that can be crossed in manuscript culture, but also religious ones. Here on the slides, another manuscript from St. Catherine's but this is a Greek gospel book that has been bound by a Muslim on a very fine and elegant binding. And since it's textiles and manuscripts that have brought us together, we cannot help but to conclude with this example, again from St. Catherine's, of a small volume containing a Greek liturgy that's covered in two different textiles, one Western and the other Islamic. What a fine way to illustrate the expansive multiculturalism evidenced by manuscripts and the textiles employed in them. That brings our presentation to a conclusion. Before signing off, we would like to give a special thanks to the textile scholars who consulted with us, as well as to Ann Pearl Williams College Special Collections Librarian who arranged for the image of the manuscripts. Thank you.